Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian priests, and we're very excited that you're going to with us for our new format. Today, we're going to be doing a shorter talk, and on every first Saturday, on Marian apparitions. And I'm going to be walking you through, today we're going to do an overview of what is a Marian apparition, what does the church do, but starting next month, we're going to actually start walking you through all the approved Marian apparitions. And so we ask you to join us each Saturday here for an Explaining the Faith talk, and each first Saturday, that same 11 o'clock talk will be on these apparitions. So we're excited you're with us. And then Brother Mark is going to pause for a couple minutes at the end of this talk. I will go vest and come back and we'll actually do the first Saturday devotions. So we're very grateful that you could be with us. And if you have to take a break, it'll be right after this talk and about five minute break, we'll get ready to do the devotions and that'll be coming up. So let us start with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us. Give us your blessing through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary. May we listen to your message through her and be open to your mercy. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, we'll do a talk, and then we will begin the first Saturday devotions. Now, as you saw on your slides, today's topic is Marian apparitions. Now, why are they so important? Okay, the approved apparitions of Mary are in accord with Scripture. They are not made up by the church. They're not hallucinations. They are messages such as Lourdes, Fatima, Guadalupe. Why are they in accord with Scripture? Okay, first of all, when Mary discovered that Elizabeth was in need, what did not she do? She went to the hill country of Judea. She came to her aid. She came to share the gift of the baby Christ child. This is the first chapter of Luke. Now, today, why should we doubt that Mary doesn't do the same thing? Who loves us as her own offspring as her own children, because Jesus gave her to us as our mother, and that she wouldn't hasten to help us in the same way, to bring us to her son. That's what she did in scripture. That's the purpose of a Marian apparition. Our mother Mary leading us back to Jesus. Now, let's look at our next slide. And those who are here with us, if they're able to dial in on, on the phone, these slides are amazing. Now, you see all those designations on the United States. You even have some South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. You see all those? These are all places of Marian apparitions. Now, if you look up at the top, these are not all approved. Some are listed as supernatural. Some as an expression of faith. Some are local tradition. Some are not yet confirmed. So this shows them all. Look at those dots all over the country, all over the world. Now, have Brother Mark go to our next slide. Here we're going to blow up just Europe. Look at that. All over Europe, those places where Mary has appeared. So this is amazing. This is a blow up of that one section of the map. And it has all the places Mary appeared. Now, let's go to the third slide. This is a little longer one. And this is since the beginning of 1500s. This is on the bottom of your screen. You see all the number of apparitions from the 1500s going all the way to 1750. Eh, okay, there's a fair number of those. There's some, not a lot. Now let's go to our fourth slide as Brother Mark changes the slide. Now look what happens. Starting with Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal in the 1800s, it started picking up. And look what happens in the 1900s or the 20th century. 
the number of Marian apparitions explodes. We have an explosion of the number of times and places Mary is appearing around the world. So I wanted to show you those slides so that you could see what we are dealing with here is God communicating with his people through Mary. Now, this has messages. They could be in either one short appearance. They could be in several appearances over several years. They could be, it depends on the message, okay? Now, it's not mandatory that the people who witness it, the seers, be saints. You know, a lot of the criticism of some of the apparitions is, well, gee, that person who saw Mary isn't living a very holy life. Okay, yeah, I think if you saw Mary, you'd pretty much straighten out your life. But it's not a requirement that you be a saint, all right? They can be normal, imperfect people. We don't want to judge it. So to be worthy of belief and devotion is what the church determines or not. It's worthy or it's not worthy. This is the whole thing. But it must be approved by the local bishop. The bishop, do you know who the pope is? The pope is just the bishop of Rome. We have bishops all over the world. Every place on this planet, even in the far woods or the highest mountains, is under a bishop. No matter where you go in the world, it's under a bishop. And so this bishop has the authority to declare this is authentic or not by the grace of God. Now, the approval process protects us from false, false teaching. And so what are the guidelines for the church to approve a Marian apparition? What does the church look at? Well, I saw Mary in my toast. I get those all the time. I get pictures of people's toast on their breakfast table. There's Mary, Father, don't you see it? Or I get them in the clouds, a lot of them in the clouds. I get a nice picture of a, a bunch of clouds that says, don't you see Mary? She appeared to me. There she is in the, in the clouds. So the church looks at these. I always tell them, talk to your local bishop. Don't talk to me. Now, the bishop has this job. The church is very careful in approving these. So the Vatican has released a set of guidelines to the public on approving apparitions and revelations. If you have had a revelation or an apparition of Mary, I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm not saying it's not true. What I'm saying is go to the church. Go to the church. The church lays out three steps in determining if it's authentic. All right? First, they question whether or not the apparition is positive or negative. What do I mean by that? All right, if it's positive, it has a very high probability of being factual. Now, if Mary comes as a space alien on a spaceship and tells you she's going to take you to Pluto, that's probably not a high probability of fact. Okay, so it's got to have a high probability of fact after investigation. Showing its moral character is good, it's not asking you to sin, follows church teaching, and is commensurate with what we've learned in Scripture. If it's anything different than that, it can't happen. Like at Bayside, I got into that Bayside apparition, I found it online one day years ago, and I was enthralled with it. Like, everything in there was amazing. And then it gets to some part that all people who wear brown shoes will go to hell. That can't be of God. Okay, I have brown shoes. <laughs> Mostly black, but I do have a couple brown shoes. So this is very important. It's showing moral values that are commensurate. Now, if it's negative, it'll show things like errors concerning the nature of the apparition, how it came about, errors concerning theology, God, Mary, or the saints, like God's not a trinity or, or things like that. Evidence that being, it's directly aimed towards getting a prophet. Like Mary appeared to me and she told me to raise money um, so that I can buy a bigger house. 
You see some of these uh, Protestant pastors that are living in $14 million houses? Uh, I guess I should say probably some Catholic bishops too. So it's not a good thing. If I come to you and say, please send me money so that I can live in a $14 million mansion, you better get rid of me. Okay, because that's not what Mary told me to tell you. Mary never would say to me, ask your beautiful Marian helpers to be able to, to give you, um, uh, a, you know, a trip to the moon on the NASA space station because you want to have fun. That's not what it's about. Now, we do need a place to live, and we got 30 guys here on the th ground, so we do need a house. That's not what I'm referring to, but we don't need Taj Mahal. We need the basic simplicity. And so the presence of grave immoral fa f acts would also be negative. Like if Mary is saying, I want you to marry this person, although you're already married in the church. You're already married to your spouse, even if things aren't going well, and Mary appears and says, you're not to be with him, you're to be with this person here. Leave your spouse um, and go get married in the justice of the peace. No, it doesn't work that way. All right? So psychological issues could make it negative. All right? So that's the first thing. Secondly, if it is positive, the church will allow devotion publicly, will allow the, you to worship or to follow that devotion publicly. That's why divine mercy is fully approved, because we are allowed to teach it and preach it publicly per the church. So you can rest assured that everything you hear from us about divine mercy is fully approved by the church. But you got to be careful on some of this other stuff. You got to be really careful. All right. So last, the church decides the level of authenticity and supernatural character it has. So it's going to tell you whether or not it's supernatural, meaning of God or not. Well, Father, how does the church know? God gave the church that authority. All right. So the duty of approving these apparitions first falls on the bishop of where it occurred. So if it occurs in Chicago, it gives to the bishop of Chicago. If it occurs in uh, Moscow, it goes to that bishop. But sometimes it can be passed up from the local bishop to the Vatican. While these Vatican-approved ones are more known, okay, their presence or not doesn't make it authentic or not. As long as the local bishop says it is authentic, the Vatican may or may not even comment on it. It doesn't have to. If you say, Father, I'm not going to follow it because the Vatican hasn't approved it. Well, if the local bishop has and the Vatican hasn't condemned it, you're okay. And there's a lot that fall in that category. All right. Why is private revelation important? I'm going to go back to my friend, Father Seraphim. Why is private level revelation important? Okay. Paul said that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, what's interesting is St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas told us who the prophets are. Who are the prophets? The prophets of the church are those who receive private revelation. So private revelation is important. Karl Rahner said that the mysteries of the church taken together, so think about this. The mysteries of the church, all of them taken together, cannot be emphasized all at once to the same degree. It's kind of like the Bible. Is everything you ever read, read in the Bible? No, the Bible itself says not everything's in the Bible. The last chapter of John, the last gospel, says not everything is in the Bible. So when people say, Father, it's not in the Bible, that doesn't make it false. If it's not in the Bible, we go to the church, and the church tells us that's the authority of Jesus. So from time to time, the Holy Spirit, Carl Rahner said, puts a spotlight on a particular mystery that the world needs to listen to at the given time, like nuclear war or something like that. That didn't exist in the Bible when it was written. But nuclear war is very important. All right, now, Catholics aren't required. Are you required to believe private revelation? Are you required? No, you are not required to participate in any devotions from any private revelation, even approved. But we recommend you look at it. Because if the church declares it worthy of belief, it's probably got a good message in there. 
but it doesn't mean you have to follow it. We suggest it. And we see in the approved apparitions of, of these Marian apparitions, nothing does it do contradicts the Bible or the authority of the church. If it does, you know it's wrong. So Our Lady often says nothing is to be done without the authority of your local bishop. Jesus told that to St. Faustina. One time St. Faustina said, Father, I, or uh, St. Faustina, Jesus said to St. Faustina that I want you to do something. And St. Faustina said, I can't. Jesus said, why? She goes, my superior said, I can't. And Jesus says, well done. Jesus told St. Faustina to follow her superior over him. That's the authority given by him to the church. That's amazing. So if an alleged apparition contradicts the church or the Bible, even if it bears fruit, it can't come from God. The authority is with that bishop. The apostolic see can get involved or not, but the bishop is the key. And the congregation of the doctrine of the faith also might get involved, but it doesn't have to. All right, let's look at our next slide. Our next slide is important because in it, these are the type of approved apparitions. You have ones way back in the tradition of the church. Those are called traditional. Many, many, many of those exist from the 100s all the way through to the 1500s. Basically, 1400 years. They've appeared to many saints, but the church didn't really define them back then. They were very, very much just tradition, all right? Now, we also have Vatican-approved ones, ones that are approved by the Vatican. There's only 16 of those. There's only 16. This is amazing. And then finally, we have the bishop-approved ones. So this is very important. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. The traditionally approved ones. All right. These have no official means of investigation because they were early in history. Early apparitions were usually just evaluated by the priest. All right. And what was the most common approval is if a church was built there. Y'all ever hear of Our Lady of the Snows? Anybody here ever hear of that? You know how that got approved? Because there was a church built where Mary said in the middle of July or August in Rome, you know how hot it gets in July or August in Rome? And Mary said, where it snows is where you will build this basilica. And it snowed heavily in a complete perfect square. And that's where they built St. Mary Major Basilica, which still stands in Rome. This was back in like the fifth or sixth century. Now the Vatican didn't have all this approval process then, but they built a basilica where it snowed in the middle of July or August in Rome. And so they built that big major basilica and therefore they say this has been approved by the church just because of the tradition of it. So we have that kind of approval way before the Vatican started documenting stuff. Now, this is very important because later bishops and even popes would visit these shrines and that would give credence. Now, sometimes the church then in like the 15th century, 16th century started to process this, document it. Now, before I get to those though, does anybody here know the earliest Marian apparition we have in the church? And I'm going to start with this next week. What's the earliest Marian apparition? It actually happened to St. James in the year 40 AD. Mary appeared to St. James in Spain, and we call it Our Lady of the Pillar. And Margaret of Greta talks about it. Brother Mark has been reading her work. And we can't wait to explain to you this incredible apparition. Actually, it was really by location because Mary was still alive. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Mary in Our Lady of the Pillar 
showed her involvement in the church. So let's look at this symbol of Our Lady of the Pillar. That is now celebrated on October the 12th, and you can see that on your screen. So basically, there's around 2,500 apparitions, but today, they're even more frequent. Do you know there's been 500 Marian apparitions in the 20th century alone? Way more than any other time in human history. And the Dictionary of Apparitions of the Virgin Mary lists all these. So what I'm teaching you is not made up from me. I'm giving you the sources of the church. And do you know 308 apparitions are attributed to saints and blesseds out of 2,500? Well, Father, I got to be a saint to see the Blessed Virgin Mary. Out of 2,500 of them, 308 are blesseds and saints. You do the math. That means Mary talks to the rest of us. And so don't think it can't happen. It can, but follow the church. I think that's fascinating. Do you know how many popes have received Marian apparitions that have been approved? Seven. Out of the hundreds of popes, seven. That's it. So all of these other 2,500 are simple people. Very simple. Many are unofficially not even recognized by the church, but you don't want to get caught into that trap. Stay with the approved ones. Now, what about ones that are a bishop approved or Vatican recognized? Trent, very important council, said that the local bishop is the first and main authority, as I've been saying, and Vatican approval is not always required. It can be present, but after Episcopal approval, Episcopal just means bishop, the Vatican may or may not do something about it. Visits, establishment of a feast day, or the canonization of those who saw Mary, that lends credence like Fatima, right? The popes have visited Fatima, they canonized Jacinta and uh, Francisco. So that lends credence, but it doesn't have to. If a Marian apparition is recognized by a bishop, it means the message is not contrary to faith and morals, and it may be venerated by the faithful, and you can believe in the supernatural content. But belief in a private revolution, revelation, as I said, is not required. You can pick if you want to follow it or not. What is the most recent one the Vatican approved? Does anybody know? The most recently Vatican recognized one it's one you've probably not heard of. Low France. Happened in 1664, but was just approved in 2008. That's the most recently approved Vatican apparition. We're going to talk about that one. What about the most recently occurring one that the Vatican approved? That one was Cabejo. That one happened, ended in 1989. So Mary is active. So the Vatican is still active. They just approved one in 2008, even though that was in the 1600s. But they also approved Cabejo, which ended in 1989. So Our Lady is working. What about in the United States? Anybody know how many approved Marian apparitions we have in the United States? One. Anybody know where? Wisconsin, Champion, Wisconsin, where I spoke a couple years ago. In 1859, there was an apparition of Mary. We'll talk about this one. And that one was approved by the bishop as well in 2010. Not by the Vatican, but by the bishop. Now, here's what the early church has revealed about private revelation. This is important. Public revelation is different from private. Public revelation is scripture and sacred tradition that we have in the church, capital T. Private revelation cannot contradict it, but is given to help explain it. Now, private revelation is binding on those who receive it. So if you're a seer and it gets approved by the church and Mary tells you to do something, you're bound to it. 
Now, the Catholic Church teaches that public revelation was completed with the death of the last apostle. So that's done. But it'd be crazy to think that God doesn't still speak to us after the death of the last apostle. So, all right. So all God has revealed to us through Scripture ended with the death of the last apostle. But do we really think God's going to stop talking to us? Of course not. And he's done it through private approved revelation. And so this is it. This is continued. I want to read you catechism number 67, if Brother Mark can put it on the screen. Let me read this. Private revelations do not belong, however, to the deposit of faith. You do not follow a private revelation over going to Mass. You do not follow a private revelation ahead of the teaching of Scripture or tradition of the church. It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation. He's already done that in Scripture. Its role is to help live more fully by, by it in a certain period of history. God's given you what to do here and now. Guided by the magisterium, the census fidelium, this is the collective sense of the faithful, knows how to discern and welcome in these revelations what constitutes an authentic call of Jesus or his saints of the church, to the church. Christian faith cannot accept revelations that claim to surpass or correct the revelation in which Christ is the fulfillment as is the case in certain non-Christian religions and also in certain recent sects which base themselves on such revelations. So if you're going to leave the church to join a new church called Our Lady of the Bamboo Pole, okay, you're missing the point. You can't do that. Some people go to one extreme or the other. I've met so many people that are nothing but private revelation people. I'm going to do every single prayer Mary ever gave in every single apparition. My prayers last 48 hours a day. You can't do it. So some people go to that extreme. You can't possibly fulfill all the requirements of prayers that Mary asked us to do in all these revelations. Can't do it. It's physically impossible. Some try. And then we have other people to the absolute opposite extreme that believe not a single thing through private revelation. And if you're neglecting what Jesus told St. Faustina just because it was private revelation, you're missing the context of church teaching. Because it doesn't contradict it, 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 it explains it. And so this is very important. Our Protestant brothers and sisters, this is important here, they denied all private revelation. Why? They had to. You know why? Because all the miracles and the teachings that occurred in private revelation over the previous 1,500 years confirmed Catholic teaching. Every single private revelation that was accepted and approved in the prior 1,500 years confirmed Catholic teaching. So the Protestant reformers had to reject it. So they said there is no such thing as private revelation. They disobeyed God's commandment. In the New Testament that says in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything. That's what the church does. Retain what is good. That's what the church does. Now, the reformers, they eradicated that. Of all new revelation, they said, nope. And it led people to forget that private and public revelation are different, but supportive of each other. Private revelation helps explain the public. And without that church guidance, you're losing something important. So with no approval process, but with the powerful effect of private revelation, what happened to the Protestants? They have splintered off into 40,000 different versions. You know why they did? Because of private revelation. If you would have maintained a central church like we have in the Catholic Church and said, okay, the church will determine what is true and what is not, you wouldn't splinter off into 40,000 pieces. Once Protestantism started, 
because it no longer maintained that authority of the church, it splintered into 40,000 pieces. That can't be correct. All right, last page, we're almost done. The religious organizations that claimed that they were seeing the truth over here, well, I see the truth over here. When you don't have the authority of the church to tell you what is the truth, everybody's gonna think I have the truth. Well, no, the Mormons now have the truth. No, the Seventh-day Adventists have the truth. No, the Methodists have the truth. You can't have 40,000 truths. And so Christ's church that was established by Jesus maintains for us what is truth. The religious organizations which claimed these new revelations evolved into things such as tens of thousands of new religions. When the Pentecostal movement started, right, in, uh, in 1900, they asked the founder who said he had private revelation, I can't remember if it was a man or a woman, and said, how do you explain this because this is on, based on private revelation which the Protestants have denied for centuries and it now is starting again? Well, the answer is private revelation never ended. You should stick with it but through the church Christ established. That's the message. The correct answer is it's private revelation never stopped. We have to discern it. So let's watch a quick video right now. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to have to do the time. I'm going to have to skip this video. I'll show it next week. I'll show the video next week. But basically, in this message, we have so many powerful gifts God gives us through his mother. But the church has to approve it. If somebody's telling you Mary said something crazy, don't listen. So the church has three types of decisions. Let's put this one up. Let's skip the uh, video. We'll show that next week. Let's show the types of decisions the church has. If you look on your screen, constat de supernatural latate, what does that mean? That means it's established as supernatural. So the church looks at it, says it is supernatural. The second one, constat de non supernatural etate. That means what? It has been established that this is not supernatural, not of God. And then third, non constat de supernatural latate means not established as supernatural, but maybe it's not defined. Meaning, I can say something is not from Minnesota, but that doesn't mean it's not from possibly Texas or Florida. So the middle one there, the second one is basically the church saying, it's not from heaven at all. The third one says, we can't say that it definitely is from heaven, but it might be. We haven't defined it yet. We, there's not enough evidence to define it. And if the vision is stopped and there's not enough evidence, it's not condemned, but it's not approved. So those are the three. So let's talk about these. The first one is basically when an apparition is judged supernatural, called worthy of belief, it has manifested signs and evidence of being authentic miracles, interventions from heaven. The judgment is possible when there is evidence of supernatural phenomenon, sound doctrine, good mental health of the seers, piety of the seers, not necessarily sainthood, and good fruit. When that's present, the church will say this is supernatural. Let's go to the second one, definitely not supernatural. The judgment here is that an alleged apparition has been shown not supernatural, either clearly means that it's not miraculous or lacks signs of miraculous nature. Private revelation, for instance, which is doctrinally dangerous or manifests hostility towards the church or the authority, cannot come from God. Father, I read this apparition online that says I am to reject my bishop. 
You can reject certain teachings if it is, well, the church is not heretical. Church will never teach you her 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 heresy. But you don't necessarily, regarding non-faith and moral issues, like if the Holy Father says we should not build a wall for immigration, and you feel, I think we should build a wall for immigration, that doesn't make you disobedient. That's a differing of opinion. But if it's about faith and morals, we have to follow. That's church teaching. It could even be demonic because the devil will persuade, but when people say all Marian apparitions are demonic, no, just the ones that are contrary to the Bible or to church teaching. Now, there could be an alleged revelation where it may also be a person's good heart that thinks it happened. Lacking evidence of being anything more than desires of the person. No fraud is intended, but it's just an act of imagination. Those will be rejected, not meaning that the person is bad, simply meaning that it came from their heart, not heaven. But the third one, and that is rejected, not because it's evil in this case, but because it's not inspired from heaven. It's by the person's own heart. It can't be approved. And then finally, the third one is we don't know enough. We're not sure. It may not be evident whether or not the alleged apparition is authentic, and the judgment would seem to be completely open to further development. Period. All right, so to finish, and then we're going to go into our first Saturday's devotion. A friend of our community named Mark Maravalli at Franciscan University has done a lot on Mary and apparitions and Mary, study of Mary. You know, taking you back to seminary here in these classes, I should have mentioned in the beginning, the class we're doing right now is Mariology, the study of Mary. The problem with Mariology is a lot of times they don't talk enough about approved private revelation. I was lucky. In seminary, we did talk about it. A lot of these notes come from that. Now, Mark Maravalli says, what is consistent about all approved Marian apparitions? Here you go. Mary gives messages tailored to a given culture at a particular time. He said, mothers are great with details. Men are not. Even Jesus didn't give a lot of detail in the Bible. What did Jesus say about in vitro fertilization? Nothing. What did Jesus say about artificial intelligence? Nothing. What did Jesus say about nuclear war? Nothing. Because these didn't exist then. Does it make them false? Or where's that in the Bible? Therefore, there can be no teaching on nuclear war? No. It means our Blessed Mother will come and help to teach. The unified message, he said, is Mary calls us to return to Jesus by living the gospel and living in charity. She tells us to do this through prayer and penance. That's the whole message of Fatima, for instance. Mary reveals herself in hopes that we will receive the fullness of public revelation that she confirms in private revelation. Public revelation, I said, comes from scripture and tradition, large T. Private revelation is ongoing and accentuates that. All right? That God wants us to focus on maybe in a new way or deeper. As I said, there have been more Marian approved apparitions since 1830 than all of history combined. This has helped us define Marian dogma. What are two examples? Ex cathedra, the only times that the Pope speaks infallibly from the chair, ex cathedra. Well, two of them were Mary, the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. This is powerful. The Immaculate Conception in 1854, the Assumption in 1950. So Marian apparitions have become necessary for our times because we have been living the gospel and we need to know how to apply it even as times change. We desperately need to return to this message and Mary helps us do that.
So she comes to tell us she loves us and to be with us. She comes to people in need, bringing grace, teaching devotion, teaching love of the gospel, repenting, accepting Jesus, being holy, and being saved. If Mary's doing that in an apparition, it is approved, and it's not demonic. This craziness, she will always lead you to sin, uh, so her son. How could her son, please let me reemphasize, please don't send letters. How could Mary be teaching us to sin? It would never be approved. And I saw this thing online as I was doing some research yesterday. And there's this big article online saying all Marian apparitions are demonic. Again, if Mary is doing all those things I just read you, coming to people in need, bringing grace, teaching devotions, teaching the gospel, explaining the gospel, repenting, accepting Jesus, becoming holy, getting saved, how could that be of Satan? Bringing you to Jesus is not of Satan. It's of Mary. And like any good mother, she warns her children, if you're on the wrong path, get on the right path. You know, I just call Mary the ultimate GPS. What does your GPS tell you if you're going the wrong way? Make a U-turn. Get off this road. I have the one program that's the mean one. You are on the wrong road. Get off. Get back to where you came from. It's hilarious. And that's basically what Mary does for us. Get off the wrong road. Make a U-turn. She's the ultimate GPS. Mary comes to call us to prayer, especially the rosary, faith, trust. And while she brings us devotion, she's always basically leading us to her son. The scapular, miraculous medal, the rosary, even her miracles lead us back to God. They're not demonic. The divine mercy message is an example. It's a gift. So thank you to you, our Marian helpers, for helping us spread that. It's fully approved. So basically, after Fatima, a new generation is learning about our faith through Our Lady. She's not standing idly by. She uses the fruits of our devotion to deepen our holiness and bring souls to God. That can't be of Satan. You know, to finish, Mary presents the solution to what ails us. Like her, we can say, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And it leads us to Jesus. So how beautiful is this? How incredible this gift. From here on out, every first Saturday, I will be doing a talk just like I did today. And we will lead you in new Marian apparitions every first Saturday, then we will follow it with doing the devotions. So I invite you to stay with us. I guess I do have a, just one minute left. I'd like to tell you some of the apparitions that we're going to be talking about. She will appear, she has appeared, and these are some of the ones that are approved by the Vatican. Brother Mark can put up on the screen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, La Salette, the Golden Heart, Knock, Fatima, Lourdes, Virgin of the Poor, Our Lady of Happy Meetings, I think my staff is asking for that one. <laughs> Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. Our Lady of Hope. Our Lady Help of Christians. Our Lady of Gerchwald in Poland. Our Lady of Leszajs in Poland. Our Lady of Saluva in Lithuania. Our Lady of Zion in Rome. And Mother of the Word, Cabejo. Now we have some bishop approved ones that we're going to talk about. Our Lady of Good Help in Champion, Wisconsin, the one approved in the U.S. Our Lady of Good Success, oh man, if you haven't heard that one, you got to join us. Our Lady of Eternal Aid, the Madonna of Montanaga. Our Lady of Sorrows, Reconciler of People and Nations. Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of uh, Kuapa, and Our Lady of the Rosary. Those are just some of the few. And then finally, we are going to talk about ones that have not been fully approved because they're so important. Medjugorje, Girabindal, Our Lady of All Nations, and the lay apostle in Ireland. Um, 
Zayatan on the uh, Egypt where she appeared on television. We'll even talk about some of the rejected, like Bayside, Conyers, and others. So with that, we are going to, on this first Saturdays, come to Our Lady and say, take us to your son, Jesus. So sorry I went a little long. Stay with us. Brother Mark is going to shut down this talk right now. But then you can log back on and to our first Saturday devotion, which will begin literally in three minutes. So God bless you and stay with us because in just a couple minutes, we're going to fulfill what Our Lady asked us to do at Fatima in the first Saturday's devotion. God bless you.